want to talk about the church. Are we essential or non-essential? Amen? And so I was talking, uh, Jim and I were together a lot this week, and so I was talking to him about it, and I just said, I, something's coming to me on the essential church. And finally he says, I don't, I don't understand essential. Said, okay, I'm going to say it differently. Do you understand that in our country, in our culture, over the last six months, they've been deeming things essential and not essential okay for example they said and and we don't feel it here in wisconsin a lot we do a little bit but like in illinois do you realize they have not opened up their churches yet most many 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 of the um restaurants are closed um there are some open i stayed at a motel in um, danville illinois and um usually they have um uh, Anyway, they, they take the little food, they, they stick it in a bag, and 
you know, a, a bottle of water and a candy bar, basically. Um, they just don't want people to communicate this, quote, disease and all of that. And, and the point here I want to make is that abortion clinics, there are no mask rules. There are no rules for how many people can sit next to each other. Do you understand that? Do you understand that liquor stores can be open and are deemed essential for people? Do you understand that these pot smoking places are deemed essential? But churches are deemed non-essential. Okay, so we had to, in Wisconsin, when this first started, I have a friend, he worked with the gover governor. I don't do things this way, but he did it this way. He went and he wrote a big, long dissertation why we should do that. I don't, I don't think... Most people today do not respond to logic, right? If, if we respond to logic, all of the riots would be over, okay? Here's what they respond to. So I just came back from, I was on the Indiana side of Louisville, Kentucky. Okay, so in Indiana, they said, we don't do riots here. They tried to close down the bridge. They arrested him, and they took him away, and they said, we don't do riots here. On the other side, on the Kentucky side, they prepared for him. They put hundreds of thousands of dollars to prepare for the protesters, and we understand people can assemble, but they're burning. Their their um, uh, two police officers were shot the night we were there. Okay, so and we're looking at the, the skyline. So I'm, I'm telling you, this is this is very close. One state says we don't do that here. The other state says we're going to prepare for you. Which way do you want it? My point is simply this: the Church of Jesus Christ has been given an opportunity right now. We have a president that says, you guys want to preach? Go ahead and preach. You, you want to gather? Go ahead and gather. And then Casey was just telling me a couple minutes ago that on Thursday, Donald Trump made a statement that they can't kill children that are full term. They, they can't kill them. That we should say, praise God. That's who we are. We're life people. We're pro-life. And as Christians, as never before, we need to take this opportunity to be the church. Then my son Jim made a statement, and I want to I say it to you. He said, the world will continually be the world until the church steps up to be the church. And so I said, Jim, say that again. So he did, and, and the world will continually be the world until the church steps up to be the church. Now, in one sense, the world's always going to be the world. But the world right now, a lot of the Ill illnesses and issues the world has is because the church of Jesus Christ has allowed those kind of things to happen. Okay? Now, that's not a guilt trip. What that is, is a, that's, a, that's a call to action right now. That's why we prayed and we asked for cleansing in this. So I want to speak to you just for a few minutes this morning on this thought. Is the church essential or non-essential? So here we go. We'll read if you, um, I'll, I'll announce the scripture and then I'll read kind of parts of it here. So they were gathered together, Jesus and the disciples at that time. Jesus asked them a question, verse 13. Who do men say that I am? Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say one of the other prophets. Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Okay, presumably, now they're all looking at each other like, we don't know. Right? I mean, you're, you're a healer. You're a pretty good preacher. You tend to have something going on here. Right? They didn't know what was going on. But Peter, he stood and he said, you remember, he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus is like, Peter, you got it. Flesh and blood. Did not reveal that to you. You didn't learn that at your mama's knee. Your rabbi didn't teach you that in Torah school. God showed you that. I have a question for you this morning. How many believe that Jesus is the Messiah of God? Raise your hand and say amen. 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 And that, that truth, Jesus said, 
I will build my church on that uh, Dr. Yungi Cho, Paul, David, whatever he ended up with over in Korea. He said that he's going to build it on the rock of revelation, and that revelation is that Jesus, if you come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, Barry McGuire, who is a guy a little bit older than I am, but some of you remember him, and he was a hippie. He was the first one to have flowered flowers on his blue jeans. He said he sewed them on himself. But the point, he said, they made a kind of a, a pact and a covenant. They were searching for truth. And if they ever found it, they would receive it. That's what they said. And so he's going along and he's heard all of the stuff and he was in Jesus Christ Superstar and all that back in the 60s and and he came and he found out somebody gave him a Bible good news for modern man didn't even know what it was threw it uh, in his house or bus or wherever he was and later when he had a little time he opened it up and he found out it was a Bible and he read the Bible and when he read the Bible he's like oh my goodness Jesus really is the Christ he, here is my answer. He said, even though I came to that conclusion and I understand it, I still had to make a choice whether I personally would agree with that or not. Isn't that amazing? Lee Strobel, if you know of him, he's a man who was a, on the uh, a lawyer for the Chicago Tribune. His wife got saved. And he thought she was in a cult, and so he was going to, he was a publisher, he was a newspaper editor, so he went in this long search to find out, to prove her wrong. And he flew into Billy Graham's association, he flew to scholars, he went all over the country, a two-year trip, and he found out, oh my goodness, everything in the Bible is true, Jesus really is the Messiah. And he said, even though I came to that conclusion, I still had to make a choice of whether I personally would believe in that or not. Isn't that amazing? So we need to have the revelation when we see it, when we understand it, that comes from the scriptures, that comes from witness, that comes from talks, that comes from the Holy Spirit. But we still need to make a choice of whether that's we're going to receive him as Savior. So what we want to do as the church is we want to take people who are over here on my left, over here, who are not in the kingdom, and we want to bring them over to here into the kingdom of God. Amen? How do you do that? You have to have a revelation of God, and you go from darkness into his marvelous light. Amen? And so, Jesus says, the church, he goes on to say, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, the Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Would you say that with me? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. So, and then if you go to chapter 18, I'll read just a little bit more. But So the word, that's the first place. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at the first four or five places where the church is either mentioned or spoken of in uh, by experience. So if you go down to verse number 15 of chapter 18, Jesus said, If your brother sins against you, go tell him your fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Can I hear an amen? If he does not listen to you, take one or two with you, and through the testimony of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Get it straightened out. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Now, there's a difference between church here and the church back in 16. The church back in 16 is the universal church that's all the way around the world all the time. How many know you have brothers and sisters in every state, every country, every, every place in the world? Somewhere there is some kind of a witness of Christian people. And if there happens not to be then we have missionaries that are going there to get them, right? That's, that's, our, that's who we are. That's what we do. But now here he's talking about the church in the local setting, your brother, your sister. So now, not, now can you be in the big universal church without being in the local church? I think that's a big question mark. But basically we understand it's kind of like you have uh, the VFW local 1017 or whatever it is. 
that's kind of what the local church is. We are local church, Northern Lights Christian Center, Hayward. Amen? But we are God's people. We are the church. The Bible says here's how you work through issues and relational issues and that kind of thing. And it happens in a local church. It happens because we want to be careful that we don't get everything is out there somewhere else. No, it's here and it's now. It's not later out there. Amen? And so we want to bring that to the local con, um, concept that we refer to the church and we live and we move and have our being in Christ and amongst other Christian people. So Jesus, first of all, Jesus prophesied that the church would exist. He, he, he just like we heard that prophecy from Kent Christmas this morning, and he prophesied and he declared, Jesus stood and he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will, he prophesied that. It hadn't happened yet, but he made a declaration of that's what he was going to do. So the church, are we essential? A, yes. Why? Because Jesus said we would be his church. Are we essential? You better believe we're essential. Now, whether or not our state, our country, or anybody else recognizes us as, as essential, we are essential. We are very, very needed. The second thing is the church collective or the church universal, as we talked about, and then as we bring to the local congregation. And that's so vitally important that you and I continually meet together. And we always want to be respectful of authorities and things like that. But we don't want to be dominated by them. And we don't want to be motivated by fear. Does everybody understand that? You don't be motivated by fear. I'm not saying never wear a mask. But when you put that mask on, speaking tongues. I mean, just thank God that you're alive and that you're here. Um, and sometimes you have to do it. I, I have to do this. All. I have to give, I have to tease myself and give myself a sense of humor. I, I put my mask on. I put my, my sunglasses on. If I have my dad's hat from the 40s, I put that on and I go into a place. I, I just have fun with it because I will not allow myself to be dominated, Right? by that. Now, we understand there are people that need to do it, so we never make fun of people. We never put it down. But we, in our hearts, we say, I'm not going to be dominated by fear. Why? Because I am a member of Christ's body. God lives in me. God dwells in me. Amen? So we're going to continue to meet together. We're going to continue to move forward. Now, if... We were, and, and you know, I'm not going to go over that again, all of the entities they said are essential, but in our hearts, we're, we need to say we are essential. In fact, let's say that together. We are essential. Why are we essential? Well, let's, let's continue to look. Um, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And there's some other verses, and I... I think you'll know this passage of Scripture. It'll resonate within you. And uh, we'll pick up in verse... Um, let's pick up in verse 15. Talking about the body of Christ, talking about the many members, Paul says, If the foot says, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? In other words, we, what we say, every single one of you has been handpicked by God Every single one of you have been washed in the blood of Jesus. God has sent his Holy Spirit to your heart, right? You are clean, you are holy, you are pure in the sight of God. And then we become part of Christ's mystical body. And so are we the body of Christ in this room today? Yes, we are. We are Christ's body. And so what happens sometimes is people get the idea, well, just what he says here. I'm not, well, what, you know, what part am I of the body? I don't, I don't know. I'm, I don't, I didn't serve communion and I can't sing very well. And I'm not a preacher and um, can't give very much money. And let me ask you a question. Do you feel like you're essential? No, you need to say, I am a member of the body of Christ. 
God has gifted me. I belong to the Lord. Now, you may or may not understand what that's all about, but I want you to know just less than two or three weeks ago when we had this gentleman coming from the state to meet with us, and after architects and state said, no, 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 right now, folks, we're getting ready in this building next door because the state came out and the state asked the question, how much time do you have? I told him two weeks. He says, let's get going on this right now. And they actually reversed it. And we're going to be using that building over there for part of our school this year. Somebody say amen. Do you know why that is? Because the church, and I'm going to get into this. He said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And that Sunday morning when you prayed, when we prayed together, we bound together and we said, Lord, we need you to move on the state. And what did God do? He moved on that man's heart. And that's just one example. I have never seen in every, and I've been here for almost 40 years, I've never seen one time, ever one time, when we brought a matter to the congregation of the Lord where that prayer was not answered. I don't care if it was money we need for sound systems, if we were going to reach out in another way, if we were going to purchase something, if we were going to buy the property. How many understand we, all, we bought property? We're moving forward. They gave us a bar out on the reservation. The stools and bar and cranky things where the beer comes out are still there. Somebody say amen. We're the church of the living God. We're alive and we're well and we're moving and we're shaking and we're breathing. Hallelujah. So he goes on here. And he says, if the whole body were an eye, <clears throat> where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the smelling be? But now God has established the parts of the body, every single one of them. And if they were all one part, what would there be a need for the body? So there are many parts of the body. The, bo the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, those parts of the body which we deem to be weaker are the more necessary, the more essential. We are essential. Everybody say, we are essential. <laughs> so when you hear the guy on the news saying, the church is no longer essential, here's what you say to that TV screen. Excuse me, sir. The church is essential. You tell him that. You say, well, he can't hear me. You're not talking to him anyway. You're talking to yourself. You're talking to demons. You're proclaiming it in the air. We are essential. Whatever they say. So, I'm talking to the good, healthy officials in this city by face-to-face -face on Zoom or whatever it is. One of the guys said, Tell them, pastors, that people can worship in their homes 24-7. They don't need to gather together. So I told one of the guys, one of the pastors next to me, I said, you better get that guy in your church because he sure doesn't know very much about the Bible. I'm just cutting up a little bit. <clears throat> <clears throat> says, what? What? Yeah, that's true. We can worship. We so we need to talk about it. I said, if seriously, if that's where you are, Dude, the conversation is over. You can take a shower in a rainstorm too. 24 hours a day if you want to. I don't know about you, but I choose to use my shower. Somebody say amen. amen. A church building has a purpose of gathering the church people together in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So, we are members one of another. We also have a connection of the church. And I did this. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to uh, belabor the point. But I do want us to see just a couple of this. The Bible says we are members. We just read it. We are members of the body of Christ. And so, uh, <clears throat> I did a little research on what the Bible says about touching, gathering, togetherness, and face-to-face. -face. And I'll give you just two or three. I found maybe 25, 30 scriptures on it, something in that, in that area. Bible says they shall lay hands on the sick. Everybody say, lay hands. 
Amen. Now, some, do you suppose there were any apostles who had any little germs in their skin? Or do you think they would lay hands on people? Jesus went up and he touched a leper. You know what the lepers had to do in those days? If they saw anybody coming, they, they came out of their leper colony to get some food. The leper would have to say, unclean, unclean. They would, they would, they would ding a bell and, and all the rest of the moms would say, oh, kitties, get away. There's a leper over there. There's a leper over there. What did Jesus do to the leper? Bible says he, you get it all, don't you? He touched him. He touched him. And the leper was healed. What is that about? We're supposed to touch. <clears throat> Bible says greet one another with a holy kiss. Now our culture, I'm going to kiss somebody when you came in today. We don't do that a lot, do we? The French do. They do it all the time. The French do it too much. Somebody say Amen. Bible says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Do you suppose that there is an interaction of germs from somebody's lip <clears throat> to somebody's cheek? What I'm saying is, and we, we don't even kiss each other in church. We, we, don't, we don't recognize that. But do you see what Paul is saying? And, and, and by the way, that's in the Bible like five times. <clears throat> Bab uh, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let him pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Touching. Neglect not the gift that was, that's in you, Paul writes to Timothy, that was given to you by prophecy, by the laying on of hands of the presbytery. And it came to pass that the father of Publius in uh, Acts 28, when Paul was stranded on the island of Miletus, he had a fever and dysentery, and Paul went to him and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. Should I go a little more? Just pick one. God worked in unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that Handkerchiefs and aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. Somebody say amen. And through the laying on of hands, the apostles, many signs and wonders were done. And then Paul writes, and I'm going to skip over a bunch of these, but he says, Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the ma manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more. Everybody say, so much the more. So much the more means we are essential and we're becoming more essential. I'm more essential today than I was yesterday. The church is more important today. Now, Dr. Martin Luther King said this, we are neither the servant nor the ruler of the state. We are the conscience of our country. Catch that? We're not, we're not saying, oh, you're a bunch of rummies. We're not going to listen to you. You don't have any, your worldview is way out there. No, what we're saying is, we are an entity set by God upon this earth. We are going to move by our word of our Heavenly Father. We're following the Bible. We're listening to the teachings of Jesus. We are not going to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some of the guys who were at this conference says that many people in their home churches are choosing. They're not going to meet this year, they're not going to meet next year, and they're projecting not even coming together as a church. People say, we have Zoom. How many here have watched on the internet or you have something to do with Zoom? You know what that is. You can pull up something you, just like we did this morning. Okay? Is that great? This is what I told the boys down there. Okay, you like Zoom? And they're like, let's Zoom everything. Let's Zoom our church services. Let's have people stand around in their pajamas, drink their coffee and eat their breakfast and watch the preacher on TV, shut it off, and we've done our religious duty for the week. Isn't that wonderful? 
I said, I got an idea for you. Here's what you need to do. Plan a great trip. Take your wife. Just say, honey, we're going to have this wonderful trip. But just book one ticket for yourself. Tell your wife to stay home. Give her a good computer. Buy her a new iPhone. And, take, and you go to Hawaii. And you say, oh, honey, see this? I'm going to turn my camera. See this? Isn't this wonderful? Oh, see that ocean wave over there? Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll see ya. I'm going to go to Margaritaville now. See you later. No. That's ridiculous, and that is, and, and I say, thank God for it. There's a place for TV. There's a place for Zoom. There's a place for tuning in. We were able to pull that thing up from last night. That's good. That's wonderful. But that's not the way God, and in fact, I was on with a group of ministers, and they said, we should meet this way all the time. I said, stop. The only reason this works is, A, because we know each other, and we, but if we don't know each other, we don't talk to each other, we're going to have issues, because I don't know what you mean. Who are you? you? You might, and now we have people, my best friends, I've never even met them. They're out there somewhere. Let's pull it back and be the essential church and operate in the body of Christ. Somebody say amen. We're connected, connected in the church. We're indwelt by the same Holy Spirit. We're members of one another. And then... There's conflict in the church. Why do they say the, uh, the smoking marijuana one on joint places? That's essential. That's okay. You don't have to wear a mask. You imagine smoking, and never mind, with a mask on. But you know what I'm saying. They say that's not, they say that's essential. But, and then out in California, did you hear what they said out there? The 10 people they do allow in there, they say, you can't be singing and praising the Lord. Make some kind of germs goes in the air. And you might catch something. Bound up people, bind up people, free people, set people free. Right? So we're all about freedom. We're all about... <sighs> State of the Bible. conflict in the church. So I woke up this morning. I shared with my wife earlier. I said, here's what the devil does. He goes to people individually. He says, you're no good. But look at the You call yourself a Christian? You treat your wife like that? You're driving record? And you know what he does? He tries to stop us before we start. What's this whole thing of abortion? Stop it. Why? Because there's a baby that's in that womb that has destined to do great things for God. Can you say amen? What does he want to do? Stop it before it comes out? What do we say? We say sometimes it can be rape. I have a cousin that my other cousin brought her to a drinking beer party. Lost track of her. A man raped her. She had a child. That child grew up. A few years ago, he's driving a motorcycle. He's been up all night. He's got his Harley. He went over to Minong. He went to Trigo Sunday morning. He said, I got a cousin in one of these towns here. He comes to Hayward. And he says, I think it's Hayward. Drugged up, drunked up. Somebody in the parking lot said, come on in with me. So they brought him in. He's drugged up. He's drunked up. He's supposed to be in jail. And he did go back there. We brought him over to our house. We fed him a meal. Tried to get him sobered up. Talked to him. Prayed with him. Went and saw him in jail. He came over to see, see me. And I was on my way to Wesleyan Church. I was to speak that night. And I, I said, why don't you just come with me? He says, where are you going? I says, I'm going to church. So I'm going to speak. You can come with me. And he's going, rrr, rrr. So I'll just come on. So the pastor down in Rice Lake, we met with him and we prayed with him. And you know what he did? He had a demon in him. He took a Bible. He threw it all over the room. He's cussing, doing all this stuff. We prayed for him. We blessed him. I 
I just saw him, I don't know, last time, I, every time I see him, he's doing better. Off his drugs, off his alcohol, married a beautiful girl, lives out in California. I went up and touched, touched, laid my hand on the back. I said, how are you doing? He started crying. He said, God is so good to me. God is just everything I do. He blesses and he touches me. It just, I'm doing better every day. You know where he came from? A rape. And he's doing great. And he loves God. And he's pressing into God. Why? We're the church. We're Christians. We validate people as essential because we are essential because God says we are essential and nobody else in the world can change a destiny like God except the church. We're the conscience of the church. You walk into a room and they're not Christians, they'll roll their eyes, they'll cuss under their breath, but down in their heart they're saying, I want to be like you and I want to have what you have and I want the gospel that you have and I'm not man enough or a woman enough to stand up for it, but don't stop talking to me. That's the truth. Are we essential? We're essential for this world. The Bible says we are the salt of the earth. Every place we go, we make a difference. Every place we go, we, we dominate. I go into a motel room, I say, anything has been in there, I cleanse it. And right now it's a holy place, it's a place where I'm going to pray, I'm going to read my Bible, I cleanse it, and God does that. Amen? We are essential. We change the world. We change the thinking of the world. We're on the radio every week. And there's been people, Jason, just wave your hand. He came from the radio broadcast. He did. His dad says, and Jason says, there are no churches. There are no, there aren't, God doesn't have any people. His dad says, tune into this broadcast if I got it straight. And listen to it. And brought his son here a year ago or whatever, a couple years ago. There he is. Now, not everybody does that. But you know what we do? When we speak truth, we say there is a God. He does love you. He does care. And we, we shape public policy. We put a conscience in the nation. Doesn't mean everybody's going to become a Christian. We pray that they do. But meanwhile, everybody say, meanwhile, back at the ranch, we're going to influence. We're going to talk about truth. You're a Christian. The church needs to stand up and step up to be Christian people. Open our mouths. Make a difference wherever we go. Whatever we do. Amen? So we're in this conflict, and what the enemy wants us to do is to be quiet. Don't meet together. And not the devil. <laughs> You'll have to decide this. <laughs> the preachers I was meeting with in that meeting, they said, Warner, why do you always have to have an exception? Because I stood up and I said, I said, okay, I want to understand this. We're tent people. We know how to do outside services. So can we meet in our parking lot? You know, this was before we were in shutdown or anything like that. Warner, why do you always have to, oh, why, do you, why don't you just sit down and shut up and submit? I said, I'm simply asking a question for clarification. I'm a Christian. I'm a minister of the gospel. And I want it right. And I want it straight. Somebody say amen. We got to stand up. We got to speak up. We got to make a difference. Why? Because we're essential. We're the light of the world. And people are full of darkness. We walk in the room. Light comes in the room. We start talking. Light comes out of our mouth. You ever see some of these miserable people that are like pro, they, they want to kill babies at full term? Are any of them friendly? Are any of them? It's like, oh, I want to be like one of them for sure. No, that's not who we are. We're light. We're truth. We smile. We love one another. We have joy in our heart. We live, we give big tips. In restaurants, in motels. Just got back from motels. So this week, 
buying, I'm buying Jim lunch. I'm talking to this lady, and I'm, I'm leaving her a tip. And I thought I was throwing ones down. <laughs> and I was throwing fives down. And she's smiling. She's getting happier. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Anyway, I give her away too much money, but she enjoyed it too much. And I'm just said, God bless you. I'm not going to take it back. You don't understand what I'm saying. Somebody say, man, oh, you make a difference. You're the light. You're the sunshine in darkness. You stir up demons by loving God, by pressing into the kingdom of God. We have this conflict. And I'll close with this final statement here well it's the calling go ahead and stand that's who we are the calling of the church the calling of the church hallelujah we're to be out there front and center for our lord jesus christ how about lifting both hands this morning father thank you for today thank you for jesus lord we thank you that we are essential we thank you that you have deemed us essential. We are your body. We are flesh of your flesh and bone of your bone. Would you say this with me? I belong to the true and living God. I have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of me. I am essential to this world, to the church, and to God himself. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. My light is shining bright. My influence is strong. I'm on my way to heaven. And by God's grace, I'm taking as many with me as I possibly can. In Jesus' name. If you receive it this morning, can you say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Put your hands together this morning.